questions from the audience regarding any of the talks that we've seen. A uh, question for Ron on using the Shukla for uh, Skiffy. So uh, Skiffy patients with Knoll's pins, uh, it's giving me a heart attack. Uh, two or three of them with softer bone got the pins out without a problem, but the pins are designed to break off, I guess, when they go in. So I had people with harder bone taking them out. They broke off every five minutes, and it took something from like, you know, two hours to three hours to get everything out and everything back in again. Number one, getting them out with Shukla. And then number two is, would you plate over the hole laterally when you, if you have to burr around the pins if they're clustered together? I've seen that scenario several times. Um, I use a carbide bit and just cut across the neck where I would do my cut. And then I use the trefine to thread over the screws and push them out laterally with that. And then I, I bridge the gap with a, uh, I, I prefer the, the monoblock Wagner stem with splines. And you're out of the problem zone. You don't restrict their weight bearing. They're doing whatever they want immediately. Show of hands, Who, who's seen a Knowles pin? Okay, yeah, the, the, I hope that you don't. Uh, for those of you whose hands are down, and I suspect that represents a lot of the fellows and, and residents. Uh, question. Tom Bradbury from Atlanta. There's a study out of Norway last year looking at the French paradox cement technique. And for the guys that do a lot of cementing, I'm just curious. It's really appealing with a forced, closed, polished design. Have you guys changed your cement mantle management over the past couple of years? Is this something you're starting to explore? And what I mean by that is line-to-line -line prep. Uh, instead of uh, the traditional totally two to four good. millimeter mantle that we've always been taught growing up. In the maintenance of certification exam this year, that was another one of the papers we had to be tested on. And one of the critical factors that was brought up earlier by John, and I'd like to just re-emphasize, is that when you talk about cement, it's stem design, surface finish, all play an important role. So if you're going to do that type of line-to-line -line French paradox type technique, you better be using the right stem. And so if you use the right stem, follow through with good cement technique, you can get excellent results, whether you do it with the more traditional two millimeter cement mantle or a line to line technique. I, I'm sorry, for the residents in the room sure. who've never heard of such a thing, would you explain what this, what this technique is? Yeah, so the, the French do a lot of things a little bit differently than the rest of us, uh, but one of the things they like to do is to do this sort of line to line technique where they have impaction brooches and um, instead of the, the usual cement technique is the brooch is about two millimeters bigger than the actual implant, so when you put the stem down, you get a nice cement mantle. That's the way we were always sort of classically taught. Many years ago, a number of French surgeons started doing this line-to-line -line technique, where it was more impaction broaching, the cancellous bone gets sort of compacted in, and there's no engineered cement mantle between the brooch and the cement. So when you look at your post-op films, pretty thin cement mantle, most of the time, U.S. surgeons would look at that and say, hey, that's not a good cement technique. They've been able to prove now with 10-year data to show that it's e uh, equivalent uh, outcomes to more traditional cement techniques. So it's a good option, but you better be using the right stem with the right surface finish to make it work properly. And John, would you mind talking a little bit more about the technique that you had to show in a whirlwind there? Uh, in the video, there was a stem coated with cement, yep. then put into a cement mantle. Will, and, and I don't know if I saw a pressurization going on there. Would you just talk for a moment about your technique for cementing through the anterior approach and how that may differ amongst patients or from a posterior approach? Sure. Uh, I guess the main things are just reiterating number one priority, which is exposure. So my exposure going into a hip where I know I'm cementing the femur is going to be more excessive. I'm going to do a good job because I'm putting more torque on the femur. I'm worried about creating a fracture anyway, or I might, or might be coming in for a, a neck fracture already. So I'm gonna make sure I do my releases and get my exposure. Uh, most of the instrumentation for cemented stems is designed off of other approaches, posterior or modified lateral. And so it, they tend to be less anterior friendly. Um, but to your point, the, <clears throat> the uh, French paradox technique I think one of the issues with that in osteoporotic bone is you also realize you'll have a slightly higher risk of introducing a fracture with your brooches because you're pushing up to the envelope of the cortical bone, whereas in a stem where you're leaving more cement mantle, you know, it's not quite as aggressive a broaching uh, in that setting. But for the pressurization standpoint, um, the retrograde fill, making sure you have your cement uh, restrictor placed 
using the flexible insertion handle for that's really important. Yeah. I can't tell you like every year, like the first couple of weeks when the fellows are here and they're doing a case and I'll see, some, I'll see a stem and I'll be like, that doesn't, something went wrong there. <laughs> and they were trying to use the metal in, insertion device for the cement restrictor. So use the, uh, the plastic one that gives a little bit more flexibility. And then retrograde fill after you evacuate the canal uh, with pressurization. And then really just not getting too excited about placing your stem early. You know, you need to know who mixed it. You need to know how long it's been since your mix. So you do need to be familiar and your, hopefully your, your scrub tech is familiar with cement, uh, you know, preparation so that you're placing your cement and you're pressurizing your stem when you're getting, you know, midway through your polymerization of your methyl methacrylate. I guess those are the, the big takeaways. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that, that where I see people get panicked. Uh, it's usually late rotation of a stem. Mm -hmm. So once the stem goes in, you know, one nice thing about doing them through the front, you don't have somebody holding the leg. Right. Right, because usually so, you're holding the stem and somebody's rotating the leg on the other end. And so you're screaming at them and trying to make sure they're not undermining the process. Yeah, you know, you, you guys brought up some really, really nice points. And again, I think this is a situation where a lot of the incoming the trainees are just not getting the experience. I also think from an innovation perspective, there is a role for innovating cement tools and techniques and potentially even stems to facilitate uh, application through an anterior approach. Krista. Yeah, maybe one uh, small comment also to adding to what John was saying about when you're panicking. It can happen when the, when the stem doesn't really um, uh, go in as fast as you would want to. Don't panic and don't try to hit it too quickly because of the viscosity of the cement. So if you hit it too quickly, then the cement viscosity, the waves go through the cement and basically the cement will, pre this, these waves will prevent the stem from sinking in further. What you need to do is you do one blow, you wait, another blow and you wait. Mm -hmm. Believe me, that helps. So don't hit it in too quickly because it won't proceed. Dr. Maddox. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just <laughs> yeah. one comment. I mean, just like we had these alarming statistics on dislocation, it's not really there with the anterior approach. We have alarming statistics about periprosthetic fracture, but, um, and I think uh, Dr. Elgin did refer to it, but we really have to talk about the type stem. For instance, with the Actus stem now, four year uh, revision rate in the Mich Michigan registry. This is all cause revision rate is one half of 1%. So it's not, we're not getting a lot of periprosthetic fractures and most of these are going in through anterior approach too. So uh, we have to look at individual techniques, individual stems, I think to uh, really get this data, but I don't find it alarming. I did, uh, I started out doing anterior approach total hip over 25 years ago. The first several hundred were cemented. Then I went to uncemented, and I had problems with periprosthetic fracture with Zweimuller, collarless cari. Once I went to collared cari, the actus, I, I really don't see it. So I think there's a, a lot of design factors in there. I'd like to just ask a question about uh, from, uh, we had, um, you gave the presentation with ortho line this morning, Dr. Hillock, and then uh, Ed Eduardo. I mean, the thing is with, I always say uh, computer guidance or maybe ortho line is good for easy cases as far as leg length, but it's not good for hard cases. What's good for hard cases is the x-ray because you can actively get information about the opposite hip. If you're just doing something standard computer guidance or maybe the ortho line, you only know about the hip you're operated. So you're going off a pre-op plan. So if the hip's very short pre-op and there's an adduction deformity and the femoral head's necrotic, knowing how far to lengthen to me is a difficult job and it's advantageous to be able to get real-time information about the other hip. Maybe you could comment and Eduardo can comment. There's a C-arm in the hallway and it can be brought in. It's a 12 inch. I can get both hips 90% of the time if I need to. I would say that happens like maybe once every two or three months. Okay, so if you get a hard case, a really big leg length discrepancy, sometimes you'll go to the C-arm rather than just using the 
ortho line and is that I, correct? I really don't use it for leg lengths. Uh, I'm using it for cut position. And the only reason I bring in the C-arm is if when I'm trialing and it's popping out to try to figure out where I've gone wrong, where did the system give me the wrong feedback? You know, and, and here's the thing about ortho line when we talk about, you know, back stiffness and acetabular position, um, I'm calibrating it where I think it belongs. I'm putting the cup in based on my calibration. They're not dislocating after spine fusions, after stiff backs. So I'm not saying I've solved all the problems, but I create bias into the position. The bias works to my advantage, so what's the downside? Yeah, the big deal to me is kind of the leg length, if you only have information on the one hip. But uh, Eduardo, when do you think with your uh, uh, ortho grid, uh, when do you think it's useful to compare to the opposite hip? When do you use the ipsilateral for comparison? I, I think uh, what we find is uh, surgeons using the contralateral side or ipsilateral side in, in different uh, uh, reasons. Uh, sometimes it's habit. Uh, and uh, there is a, a pre-op planning where the ipsilateral side is just something that they want to reference. Um, I think the uh, time to use it, if you're the contralateral side, is, is just a bad reference. So in the case of uh, revision hip on the other side or some sort of fracture, um, doesn't come always to be... Um, the, the other time is subjective leg length discrepancies. You see per cases, for example, where you put... Uh, uh, blocks and you have a radiographic measurement that could be off. You could have a lot of shortening on one on one end radiographically, maybe 20 millimeters, 25 millimeters, and uh, with a block you find that the perceived leg length is restored with maybe you know half of that, 15, 12, or 13. So not matching the contralateral side at that point makes sense. But otherwise, for your routine cases, as you, most physicians look at the contralateral side. Uh, as an option to uh, restore what may be the soft tissue tension. One other corollary that we really haven't talked much about is femoral antiversion. I think in these most challenging cases with, if you want to talk about HSS type 2B where you've got a flat back um, and um, severe stiffness, we're only looking at half the equation when we, when we talk about the cup. You know, you're looking at the cup on fluoro and you're getting your leg length and really focusing on offset. Don't under-restore the offset in those really stiff spines. But no one, I, at least maybe I missed it, but there wasn't a whole lot of discussion about optimal femoral antiversion, and combined antiversion is always going to be uh, more predictive of stability. And I think that probably would be true in the most challenging cases, even with the anterior approach. On the technology side, I think um, that's something we're definitely uh, have to kind of look into for sure. And we are looking at different ways to solve that problems uh, in a very near future, actually, with uh, femoral version. Yeah, I find it very helpful to have um, the pre-op CT scan, three-dimensional planning, pre-operative arc of motion prior to impingement with the patient's actual sacral slope change in sitting and standing. But I'm a posterior approach guy. I totally appreciate what you guys are saying. You have a much better margin for error even in the stiff spine. I would just argue that in the most challenging cases, whether it's femoral deformity and stiff spines, there still may be a role for that even with the anterior approach. Just to go back, to Richard, to your talk about um, you, you use a lot of registry data, um, but certainly in the British registry, periprosthetic fractures get missed. So the, the, a lot of the cemented Vancouver uh, two, uh, sorry, B fractures will end up with a, a plate from Dan to Beersheba, and they're a success in the registry. Yep. So, well, so those graphs were unduly optimistic for cement, I would say. Every registry study has lots of limitations with regard to selection bias, and uh, absolutely true. But when you look at the complementary data from the US, Australia, and the UK, I think there's a clear trend towards substantial risk for periprosthetic fracture with cementless stems and elderly females. So there was some discussion about you know, selective releasing of the rotators, selective releasing of the capsule. You know, we train fellows at our shop, I think, as a lot of you all do. And the biggest problem for me is them broaching out the lateral cortex if the exposure is not good. So is there any data to suggest that doing selective releases gives a patient any better of an outcome than just releasing everything every time and getting the femur up for a good view and a good broach? I don't know of any literature to support or refute that. I guess when you say releasing everything, I guess you just try to quantify that. Capsule, piriformis, conjoint. I don't know of any evidence. So leaving your externus? Leaving the externus. I don't know of any. I don't, I don't think know of any data any that data. reports that. I think a better question probably is for any surgeons in the audience with a profound, long experience. Any thoughts on the value of selectively releasing versus 
uh, extensive releases. I just think for the uh, for these patients in particular, right, that are at higher risk for intraoperative periprosthetic fracture um, or early postoperative, which was probably iatrogenic in nature. I mean, the overall thing that I want to talk to the fellows and residents is when you begin to broach for one of these stems, so let's say a cemented stem or whatever it is, where you want to make sure you have your exposure. If, if the cut aspect of the calcar is parallel with the anterior wall of the acetabulum, you're, you're there. Like you've got your, you've got, you've done what you needed to do on the femoral side to get your exposure, and that should afford you relatively direct broaching, you know, where you're not working around the corner and having somebody go out the posterior lateral side of the femur. So, and sometimes it's deceiving. Sometimes you don't need to do the release to get there, depending on the preoperative flexibility. And the neck fractures sometimes are quite hypermobile because they didn't have pre-existing arthritis. I have no hesitation doing releases as necessary. I think you do what, what you need to do. And it's, you know, like I said, you know, right at the beginning, don't settle for it's good enough. You have to have great exposure. And if you don't, then just release what you need to. And I think one of the learning curves is knowing when you have enough exposure and when you can potentially get it better. And you gave great tips on getting better and better exposure. How has your, how has your practice changed over your experience with this operation as far as the releases themselves go? Sure, I was much more generous early on, um, didn't think twice about it, and uh, now I try to be very selective at what I do. I just try to be a, a better surgeon and, and release less. Although, again, I, you know, the question was, have you seen any difference if you do more releases or less? And quite frankly, I don't. Yeah. Um, but as a purist, I try to do as little as I have to do. I just had a comment in terms of, you know, yes. I've gone to these meetings, some of the, and they talk about cementing, and then, you know, I go home and I'm like, I'm going to cement this case. This is the one to cement. Then you look at the cement mantle post op me like shit, you know? I would have done a much better job if I didn't cement. And now I'm worrying about this patient, right? And, you know, I think that cementing is an art and you gotta do plenty of it to get good at it. If not, I think like, for example, in my hands, I think cementing is a bad idea, so. Maybe that's the argument for us all practicing a little bit more. And then uh, I'll say one thing about my experience with that cement mantle is that a lot of the patients that we're talking about, the radiographic appearance doesn't necessarily correspond with a bad outcome, functional outcome for that patient in the long run. I bet that's true for your patients too. So. Um, well, listen, thank you all very, very much. I think we're going to go off to lunch and then resume. Uh, the